Hey there, family. How you doing? I wake up down the road. Peace, peace to you, peace to your home, peace to your family, peace to your community, peace to your ancestry, peace to my community, peace to my ancestry, peace to the nation that you are living in. And if you do, peace also to the God of Fortune, the great God of all time. Oh, ooh, this is a team of Roddy. <clears throat> so, big up to the uh, ancestors, much love to you. Uh, they're the ones who pushed me to do this. Um, so, I'm going to show you first a book that I have not had in a while. Because this is going to give um, you an idea of what I'm talking about. This is the title of the book. Okay. Now, it looks pretty thick already. Okay. But the pages are remarkably thin. And just to give you an idea um, of the content. That's the content. Okay. So why am I why am I showing you this? <clears throat> this is nearly a seven hundred page book. The pages though are rather thin. This is a book that took a break to be published. I thought it stopped. Um so that people with means We'll read that. There's a book that came out 2010, 2009, 2010, one of those called The Quant, Q U A N T S. It was one of the many books that I listened to while I was working um, back in 2010 and 2009. And what the book essentially does is it explains how a group of mathematicians used their supposed advanced minds and um, gold string uh, equations to create the situations that led to the financial collapse of 2008. Now, uh, some coffee. <laughs> this was interesting to me because, you know, we were in an age back then where we were starting to hear a lot about algorithms. So I assumed that what they were talking about was basically the same thing as algorithms. What I've learned since then is they weren't. Um, there was another book called Crashed. C-R-A-S-H-E-D by Tooze, T-O-O-D-E. Another thick book, 700 plus pages. I listened to that during the pandemic while I was working. Um, which kind of disavowed me with this and helped me understand this and focus more on the policy um, aspect of the equations that they were using and the fact that the equations weren't that well regulated because most of the politicians didn't understand what the hell they were doing. Why? Because it was very, 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 very supposedly advanced math. Earlier this year, when I discovered this book, my ancestors told me to get it, I was kind of shocked. I was like, why? Um, and then I opened it up to the contents. And I started going through it, and that's when I realized this is game theory. This is game theory. This is advanced game theory, but in effect, it's your own game theory. Now, most of you have no clue what game theory is. This is one of the things that um, uh, I came across for the first time when I was 22, I believe. I came across game theory. I didn't study it because at the time, outside of <clears throat> books that thinly talked about it, most of the really good books a person like me who was making, and I'm not joking here, $300 a week, the books that really talked about it, which were $50, $60, $70, I, I couldn't afford them. So I couldn't, so, you know, I stayed away from that. I couldn't study it. 
um, but I was familiar with it. What I wasn't familiar with is the almost multi-dimensional aspect of game theory. Um, a lot of these games like Magic the Gathering, things like that, they utilize a form of game theory that is supposed to be multidimensional. And by multidimensional, I ain't talking about it takes into account multi-facets of this society. I'm talking literally multidimensional. Many of you have played Magic the Gathering, I have not. Um, I watched Magic the Gathering played, played it. It's not really something that I It's like D and D, Dungeons and Dragons, just not something I engage. You know, I like doing. But these games use multi-dimensional strategies, and you have to be able to focus on the multi-layers of impact that occurs um, within the game that you're playing. So when you play a card, the goal of each team play. Um, and sometimes uh, when you're just doing individuals, is to catch the person using a card in a fashion or in a way that leaves them vulnerable. This is the stuff white people are doing. <laughs> now, you know, Bobby Hammett um, and Phil Valentine, but mostly Bobby Hammett, um, really got me going down the road of seeing this as important. Him explaining the the depth of games was very powerful. The thing, though, that he, and, and maybe he did mention this in a video, and I just didn't see it. I've seen most of his stuff. Um, in fact, I have a nice collection of his videos. Uh, and when I say nice collection of his videos, I mean uh, uh, probably almost 150. Uh, but one thing he didn't talk about was game theory. He talked about games and the power of them and why, why black people need to be engaged in it and looking at it and thinking about it. But he didn't mention the exact term so far that I can remember. And I sure enough didn't, uh, you know, I don't remember him saying it. He didn't talk about game theory and the importance of game theory um, in not only those games and spiritual matters, but also in everyday life. The books that I came across back in 2002, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, 2004, 2004, which talked about game theory, focused on game theory as it impacted on Wall Street. It focused on game theory as it impacted commodity trading and trading on Wall Street and and things that um, you wouldn't even think of game theory being used for. It also talked about game theory in corporations. Now, I imagine if I had started reading those books back then, I would run into this book. Now, this book is older, guys. This book is older, and the crazy thing is... Um, I mean, look at how, this thing is in really good condition. This thing was published in 1953. 1953. So, the ancestors wanted me to start off with this book. So I could shift. Because advanced mathematicians in the black community need to rise up. They need to now get serious about something powerful. And I kick myself because the ancestors have been telling me to go out there and get this set of books now for like two and a half, three years. But I was like, I ain't gonna need them. So why should I get them? And now I need them. What books am I talking about? <clears throat> what I'm talking about is Marx, Marx's Capital, and there's another group of books that he did 
um, and I'm completely blanking on it right now. When Marx is capital, M R X, Marx, yes, that Marx, Karl Marx. Why? Why? Karl Marx, I know he's given you know horrible treatment within black circles. He's the devil. He's horrible. He's this. He's that. But what I've learned about white people is, and 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 um, Bobby Hammond talked about this. When they're telling you to run away from somebody, you're not going to go for it. Um, there's this brother that I love listening to. Oh my God, he is so thorough with his economic analyses. Um, and how am I even? Oh, how am I even? Blanking on his face, uh, on his name, I can see his face. Uh, Michael Hudson, Michael Hudson, who is a Marxist, who is a Marxist. But I'm bringing him up to show you something. A few moments ago, I said white people are telling you to stay away from something. You probably want to run towards it. Michael Hudson, the example that I love to use, because he was a Marxist and is a Marxist. He was a Marxist uh, in the 1960s. And it didn't stop one of the biggest firms on Wall Street from hiring him. He was a Marxist. They knew it. He denied it. He was like, I hate capitalism. I hate capitalism because of all of these problems with it. I can list it. I can tell you about it. I can show it to you. That's why I hate capitalism. I'm a Marxist because I hate capitalism. And this big Wall Street firm, with clients all across the world, said, that's all I got. How much do you want to come and work for us? Oh, no, no, no. We don't want you to get rid of the Marxism. We want the Marxism. Come on. We'll write you a check right now. How many zeros? Okay. Yeah. Come work for us. <laughs> While you are arguing with other people about the diabolicalness of Marx, he was getting paid. And he's a Marxist. Why is this important? Because let me tell you why white people want you to stay away from Marx. <clears throat> of all the texts, texts, books, that can explain to you the mechanical arithmetic workings in capitalism, Nobody beats Karl Marx. There's philosophical works. There are analytical works. But Marx, in his many values, and I think his other one is on surplus value, he does a better job of explaining to the capitalists what capitalism is than other people who consider themselves capitalists. I'm not even a Marxist in her understand this. He gets it more than they do. Now, what does this have to do with black mathematicians? Because I don't have Marx's capital here right now, I'm going to use this book. That book. Ooh, that's the page I was looking for, too. Let me see if I can get it right here real quick. Okay, not me. Now, if you read Marx's Capital, you're going to find, in particularly the second volume, but also in the first, you're going to find a lot of philosophy, you're going to find some history, but you're going to also find a lot of equations. And the reason he has equations, is to present complex, hard to visualize um, concepts so the mind can see them. In this book, this book, he does, they do the same thing. Von Neumann and Morgenstern do the same thing. And I want to give you an example of this. Alright. 
down to black mathematicians who have a flair for sociology, a flair for psychology, a flair for economics. <clears throat> You have to work on building a new system based on the system's approach to building new systems. Meaning what? It's not just an, 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 an uh, when I say systems approach to building systems, there's a whole school of thought that, you know, you can, you, I'm not sure even how, um, where it is taught in academia anymore, but it's, it's, it's called the theory of systems. We need our mathematicians to take into account variables, multiple places, and to write volumes as descriptive as Karl Marx's capital. You want to know really what's going to bring Africa together and Pan-Africanism into reality? <clears throat> it is works like this. This is the thing that is missing from most of the works that I have seen when it comes to Afrocentrism. Many people <coughs> excuse me, can talk about the, uh, the philosophy of Afrocentrism. Many people can talk about the, the um, historical analyses in Afrocentrism. But when it comes to systematizing Afrocentrism and Pan-Africanism, when it comes to expanding it beyond a historical scope so that it could be um, seen and critiqued and what have you, it don't exist. It doesn't exist. At least I, at least I haven't found it. And I, um, I, I ordered, I can't even, can think of the title of it right now. It's over there. Mm. But I ordered a book, and it has multiple, um, probably ten or more, I think ten or more. Authors on Twitter talking about Afrocentrism. And it didn't even dawn on me. Until the ancestors told me that the problem isn't just that we have a philosophy, that we don't educate people with a philosophy of Afrocentrism, that we don't educate people with a um, theory of, of, uh, uh, of Afrocentrism, that you know, we can't visualize Pan-Africanism, but that the depths of African uh, uh, of Afrocentrism and Pan-Africanism haven't even been worked out. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And they showed me a couple of things. I'll be right back, y'all. All right, I'm back. So they showed me a couple of things, and I had to go and grab some more books. So um, first, I mentioned that book where there is a, there's like 10 people who contributed to it. This is the book. This is the book. The Afrocentric Paradigm. 
Amazama. A M A M A Z A M A. Um and a little quick overview. They showed me that. Then they showed me the Black's Law Dictionary. My, my Black, the Black's Law Dictionary that I have, sitting right over there, I purchased for under 20 bucks. And <clears throat> they answered to said to me, a book like this would buy accessible dictionary, but not just like the Black's Law Dictionary. Now, there's another group of books by a brother, he ain't really brother, by a guy named Palgrave, P-A-L-G-R-A-V-E. Palgrave, for people in the know, um, is, has, or did build back in the 1800s, one of the greatest imperial reference guides created of the time. It was a masterwork, as Bob Shop would say. Um, there were three volumes. They talked about everything except colonialism. It was a colonialism or imperialism. One of them two words don't actually um, um, exist. Don't exist in his masterwork, which is funny because he was from England, and that's who he was writing for. Anyway, <clears throat> Basically, what Palgrave did was in this reference set, there's three of them, three books, a um, couple thousand pages, I believe, was he took the system that Europe was building throughout the world, and he described it in this book. Now, he didn't use um, as much math as we used in here, but his explanations when put together with um, Marx's work give you a powerful, and with some other people who I'm going to get into in a moment, give you a powerful um, reference point for the, for the society that was being built throughout the world, the societies that were being built throughout the world by the British and Americans and basically the whole Eurocentric cabal. They also showed me <clears throat> this. I found this a couple of um, last year or the year before. And what's so interesting about this is it's referential, meaning it'll give you. Um, it'll give you a concept, determinism, for instance, page 117. And then after it discusses determinism, it gives you suggested reading. Now, I'm confident Afrocentricity has something like that sitting around. I'm confident Afrocentricity has something like that sitting around. The thing is, it's not easily accessible, at least to a lot of black people. Now, the reason they're, they're concerning themselves with this is because Africa's going to have to save the world. Africa will have to save the world. China can't do it. Because China is infected with the same problem that um, the west of Asia. China is in the east of Asia. Europe is in the west of Asia. And Europe is essentially one country. It just doesn't want to believe it's one country. It's just not one culture. China isn't one culture either, but it sees itself as one country. China is infected in the same with the same disease as its Western cousins. It just does it with a smile because, you know, its Western cousins have, have ruined the stick approach. So China will be exposed 
and they will be driven out of Africa just like the white people were, especially as the Chinese and the Japanese start to intermingle with the Africans and they start to produce babies. Um, that's going to be a whole new problem for them. Because the Chinese are going to hit back on their roots, and those babies, most of them, are going to side with their fathers and mothers in Africa. And that's going to be one of the driving forces of African independence when it becomes clear that all the Chinese are doing is, is exploiting Africa, just like the Europeans. We have to be ready to take our pro, uh, to take our position to do the work that we must do. Now, it is just to show you a couple of books that need to be reconsidered, and these type of books need to be written um, for Africa. Democracy in America. Democracy in America. Afrocentrism in Africa in the diaspora. There should be a book that is a couple thousand pages, multiple volume. Afro uh, Pan Africanism and Afrocentricity in the African diaspora. We're one people, we're not one culture. That's the goal. You don't want to be one culture, you want to be a people. United by consensus understanding, which is who we are. This should be created for Afrocentricity. They didn't give me this. They didn't show me this, should I say. Um, an African version. Not about free market. A cooperative economy. Commonwealth principle in Africa. We should have this. And in fact, look, the one thing that all of these entities that supposedly want Africa to be, you know, free, one of the things that they all have in common is they fear us putting books like this together. Because these type of books mean that we're willing to work together and willing to consider um, ourselves one, even though we have different cultures. And they fear that. And they fear it. And they don't need to fear it because we're going to treat them a heck of a lot better than they treated us. But they have to keep going and keep believing in the lie. Because if they don't, then they have to face the facts of what they've done. And then finally, they showed me this. I've showed you guys this before. Um, written by this book. Um, <clears throat> an accessible Pan African dictionary that really describes all of the jargon that people need to know about Pan African. Day is coming, y'all. Our black mathematicians have to wake up. You can't just be stuck in the science realm, in the math realm. You have to get into the social realm. You have to get uh, into the economic, the political realm, and understand it all. If you can't do it, then you're wasting your time and hours. Questions, comments, concerns, y'all know how to get at me. Believe it. I'm your brother, my man, Beast, on Natural Round. Peace.